has also been ordained by your maker himself. So I think of that story and I think of the story of Abraham and I think the same thing. He was old and every step he took had to be ordained and he had to live by faith because of that. So yeah, he was as good as dead. So therefore, from one man and him as good as dead, were born from descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. They all died in faith, um, not having received things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had the opportunity to return. But as, that, but as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. God, and he has prepared for them a city. So while, what does this faith look like? What does faith look like when it begins to take root in our lives and begins to show in the way that we outwardly live? Because like I said, yes, it's rooted in our discontent, but when it begins to take shape, one of the things that we see is that faith lives in anticipation. Faith lives in anticipation. Um, so yes, what we see is that they desired for something better. In fact, here it's said that if they had thought of the land that they had just left, if their eyes were fixed on what was behind them, it would have been perfectly fine for them to just go back. But they wanted more than that. They didn't know exactly what was ahead. Earlier in verse 8, it said that you know where they were going wasn't exactly certain. But you know what was certain is the God who they worshipped. So while things may not be so clear, and while we may not know what to do, God, my eyes are going to be fixed on you. They could have returned. They could have returned. And what's awesome is that if we look again in verse 14, it says um, they were people. That's making it clear that they were seeking a homeland. In saying that they were seeking a homeland, they followed God wherever he called them because wherever he was calling them, that's home. And we've talked about this before. Home is not here. Home is with Jesus. So wherever he calls us to, as, however hard it may be, that's where I want to be. That's where my heart's going to be most at peace that's where um, my God and I are going to be most intimate. That's where I'm going to say no matter what happens, all is well. And I believe that as comfortable as this initial homeland that they left may have been, seeking that in the midst of the dangers, traveling across lands that they were not from, they lived in tents, that was worth it. Because they left and God said to Abraham that you were going to inherit this city that I'm promising you. And out of you uh, was going to become many, more than the stars in the heaven, more than the grains of sand. And what we find is that in faith we hold to these God-given promises. And because of what we see in Scripture we find that no matter how long we have to hold on to them and no matter how long we have to fight for them, these promises that God makes are completely worth it. And that alone, I believe that this has to remind us how important it is for us to get into Scripture. Guys, because getting into your Bibles yourselves is how we get to know who God is, what he does, what he's done, and what he's going to do, and how he's forming us. Because while God may work in mysterious ways, God is also relentlessly consistent. Because the God in Genesis and the Old Testament is our God today. 
Get to know who he is. Get to know how he works. Get to know the promises that he makes and know that God is exactly who he says he is and he is going to do exactly what he has set out to do. But if we're not getting into scripture, we don't know those things. And if we don't know what he's doing, we begin to wander around aimlessly And we begin to put our faith in things that are far less sturdy, things that are bound to fail us. And what ends up happening is we end up falling into faulty religion where rather than leaning on a God who has loved us and sacrificed for us, we find ourselves trying to gain something that we could never put a name to. And we know, because if you've come to grips with the gospel, that this is something you could never be good enough to earn. But that's only going to be grasped when you get into scripture and see that we are always going to be justified by our faith in what Jesus has done for us and how our God is the Lord of everything. So again, when we think about who he is and the fact that he's going to do what he said he does, we find that we have this fuel for this enduring faith where, like I said, no matter how long we have to wait and no matter how long and how hard we have to fight, this is so worth it. Uh, This is seen as we move on. In in verse 17, it says, By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in an act of offering up his only son, his only begotten son. Sound familiar? Yes, it should. Of whom it was said, Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. And he considered that God was even able to raise him from the dead. Yes, this only begotten son, Isaac, was going to be raised from the dead. And yes, this was mean to foreshadow exactly who you're thinking of Christ Jesus from which figuratively speaking because he was just a shadow of who the coming Jesus he did receive him back by faith Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau and by faith Jacob when dying blessed each of the sons of Joseph bowing in worship over the head of his staff and by faith Joseph at the end of his life made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave them directions concerning his bones. I'll take a step back. You know what anticipation looks like? Anticipation looks like Joseph, who knew that at a certain point, guys, if we're bound in in, in slavery, at a certain point, we're getting out of here. And if we get out of here, even if I'm dead, bear up, dig me up, and take my bones with you, because we're not meant to stay here. That's what faithful anticipation looks like. We're even looking beyond yourself. Even when Joseph died, he knew that we weren't meant for slavery. And if that's the case and our God is faithful, dig up my bones and take me with you. A life of faith is rooted in discontent, but lives in anticipation because it knows for certain that God is who he says he is and he's going to do exactly what he said he's going to do. That's why it's important to get in the scripture. So not only does faith anticipate as we move on, we also realize that faith is never stagnant. Uh, We're going to move to verses uh, 32. And here it says, What more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, of Barak, Samson, uh, Jephthah, and David, and Samuel, and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, and became mighty in war, and put foreign armies to flight." Faith isn't stagnant. You know what faith does? Faith moves, faith acts, and faith avoids a life of merely sitting in a rocking chair and twiddling its thumbs. And when I initially wrote this, I had a hard time writing this idea that a faithful life avoids the rocking chair for two reasons. One, I love rocking chairs. Like ever since I was a kid, I would climb onto one of those bad boys and just kick off the floor as hard as I could and just swing until my heart was full. Man, rocking chairs are great. 
Two, um, I had a weird time writing this also because a couple years ago, a good friend of mine taught it at the youth camp, and he really encouraged people to find their rocking chair, as in find this quiet place where you get to sit down and dive into scripture and have your alone time with God. And in that sense, yes, I believe you should find your rocking chair. But what I'm referring to is do not think that you are being active when all you're doing is rocking your time away. Because faith moves. Faith doesn't idly sit in a rocking chair. Faith doesn't twiddle its thumbs. Faith does not um, merely go and say, you know what, God has this, I'm just going to sit down. And the, um, the, the examples that we have, starting in verse 32, is God calling people to raise up armies so that his kingdom could expand. It's not as if God called these people and said, all right, we're going to move in on this, er- uh, on this territory, but you guys can sit down. I got this, and when I'm done, you guys can set up camp. No, that's not how it works. Faithful living doesn't assume that we don't have to do anything because God has this. Faithful living also doesn't assume that it's somebody else's job. Faithful living assumes responsibility for ourselves, but knows that God is the one supplying the power. I'll say that again. Faithful living does not believe that this is somebody else's job. Faithful living knows that we all have a responsibility, but that God supplies the power for that. And it also remembers that mission begins with submission. What's crazy about the way faith moves and it never being stagnant also shows that a faithful life um, moves in such a way that we are called to just absurd, um, absurd circumstances. And we see this throughout scripture. We are called to follow in just a profoundly ridiculous ways. And ridiculous, I'm, I'm talking about ways that prove that God had to be in it. Because if he weren't, it never would have worked. And in retrospect, the only way some things in our lives and in scripture worked were because God was the one who really supplied the power. And This is one of the ways that God has allowed me to reconcile a lot of the Sunday school stories that I grew up with. Um, There was one point in my ministry career that I looked at Sunday school almost as like, as something funny because when I was doing youth ministry at the time, we were trying to transition people from Sunday school to fairly adult conversations. And it was weird trying to find out what this mix was. So we were having these um, talk back groups after I preach with teenagers. And we're like, how do we transition people from talking about Noah's Ark to talking about seeing drugs at school? And I didn't give Sunday school the respect that it, it deserved. Because now I see that all the things I learned in Sunday school has a different amount of weight now as an adult because like I said, now that I know that faithful living is never stagnant and it also calls us to obey in these ridiculously absurd ways, we see the power that was really behind it. And by this I mean ways where it seemed like God would have had his back up against the wall because we had no power but he shined through and it was so unlikely as in you think about the story of David where David was going to help uh, defeat this army and he had to slay this giant he was this tiny shepherd and that didn't make sense because that never would have happened except faith and then God worked we also see moments like like Gideon where Gideon was called to grow an army he's like all right let me gather as many people as I could and God's like no let's keep cutting this in half let's cut into a quarter let's cut it to an eighth All of a sudden, he had like no people. It didn't make sense that this handful of people was going to defeat an army, except by faith and by God's power. And you know what's really absurd? One of the stories I remember growing up as a kid, and I didn't never paid much attention to. Think about the, the walls of Jericho. Think about Joshua. That story just does not make sense. It's like, okay, guys, you see Jericho over there? They got this giant wall. You guys are going to go over there. I don't need the army. I need you to find, like, find your marching band real quick. 
We're going to take your marching band over there. We're going to walk around it a couple times. And at a certain point, blow your horns really loud. He's like, you, you know how to fight? You, you can sit on the bench. You play the flute? Bro, come on over here. You play the oboe? Oh, boy. Let's go. And then you see them. They go. And in such a way, it's like, all right, this happens. And you realize before they did this, Joshua had to tell them that this was the plan. You think about that? That was crazy. This is like post-Moses, all right? Moses is gone, and, and now it's my turn, and right, we're going to lead our people, and the first thing that you're going to tell them is the way I'm going to lead you, God told us to walk around and blow our horns. Absurd. Impossible. Except by faith in God's power. Amen? And... Th- Even in our lives today, there are just these blessed absurdities where Christ um, makes 